welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Sluckbaum, and today we're going to take you into the land of secrets and classification regarding space strategy, operations, and industrial innovation. For this episode, our thesis is point blank and direct. Things are simply too overclassified. We've taken something that was intended to protect our crown jewels of the space capabilities, and we've made it incredibly difficult to communicate budgets, strategy, and even explain the threats to the public and to industry. Now, here's case in point. Let's listen to General John Hyten, Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In many cases in the department, uh, we're just so overclassified, uh, it's ridiculous. Just unbelievably ridiculous. So for those unfamiliar here, here's how classification works. There are multiple levels of classification depending on the risk of the information getting into the wrong hands. At a macro level, there is basically secret and top secret. But then there are numerous compartments and special access programs past that, and they have a limited need to know for only a specific number of people. And only those closely connected to a program or a mission gain access into those specific details. So even though you might have a top secret clearance, there's still plenty you won't know because you don't have access to the compartment or the special access program. And on top of it all, with the highest clearances, if you don't need to know in order to get the job done, then you're cut out of the loop. In fact, almost no one has universal access to all of the nation's secrets. And this doesn't just apply to those in government contractors, academics, scientists, and more, a huge range of players tied to the national security complex, they're all tied into this with various degrees of classification access. So the questions are simple here. How much classification is enough? And where do we hit a tipping point where it actually gets in the way of meeting our national security goals? As with anything, it all comes down to balance. So to kick this off from a defense leadership vantage point, is Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Center Director, the Honorable Matt Donovan. Now, as all of you know, Matt served as the Under Secretary of the Air Force. He was the Acting Secretary of the Air Force and just wrapped up a tour as the Under Secretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness. He has also served as a professional staff member on the Senate Armed Service Committee. So he's been around a few different blocks on this issue. So with that, sir, thanks for being here. Good to be back, Slick. You know, let's dive right into this. Uh, and, and with your experience from a leadership perspective, how do you see this issue affecting the space mission? Uh, we know General Hyden has been very vocal uh, on this issue. And I just want to really understand how you see it, because it obviously impacts the DOD's ability to communicate the threat and the requirements needed for the Space Force to answer the threats. And one could argue, most importantly, the budgeting issue. So uh, is this just a strategic issue or do you think it has a broader impact? Well, it's like uh, I think this is a great topic, and uh, and it's uh, it's really important that uh, that we get to some sort of fruition on this. So, overclassification presents challenges at at many different levels, from strategic level decisions like building national security strategies or national defense or national military strategies, also to the operational level where combatant commanders building campaign plans. And then down to the tactical levels where those campaign plans are executed by the warfighting components in real time. So if within a strategy or campaign plan or in the tactical execution of a plan, there are parts of the plan or capabilities that are unknown by some of the players, you then don't get the synergies that you think you're getting when building or executing those plans to begin with. And on the other hand, there are also challenges in providing funding and resource allocation plans. For example, when building the DOD program objective memorandum, or the five-year POM, as we call it. I've been in meetings in the Pentagon when competing for funding, where you can't talk about the capabilities of programs for which you are arguing to get funded because of their stovepipe and compartmentalized nature. That's crazy. As you can imagine, in a room full of decision makers deciding budget priorities, you're not going to be very effective in winning arguments by just saying, trust me, this is important. Right. So the, the challenge is most acute in the space world. And uh, as you heard, where General Hyten has argued against overclassification for years. I've heard him give examples of programs that are so highly classified where only the four-star general and, and maybe his three-star deputy are read into the program. And General Hyten will be the first to tell you that four-stars or three-stars don't make very good action officers 
when it comes to integrating a capability or a program into either a campaign plan or a budget priorities list. Now, I, you know, I'm not saying these programs should include everyone in the military being read into them. But the security classification schema that goes along with the program needs to consider from all levels, strategic to tactical, who really needs to know about these capabilities so we can maximize the synergies of having the capability in the first place. Oh, absolutely. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, how do you think this overclassification has affected our abilities to deter uh, our adversaries? Because uh, deterrence obviously depends on an adversary knowing that you have a capability. Uh, otherwise, it just seems like we're spending money in a vacuum to make ourselves feel better, but missing the fundamental point of deterrence. Well, that's exactly right. And, and what we need to do is take a very hard look at what capabilities we keep concealed as in our, quote, ace in the hole capabilities, if you will, that we would only use in an actual conflict to ensure we maintain the military overmatch we'd need to ensure victory without allowing the enemy to devise ways to defeat that particular capability by having advanced knowledge of it. Right. We should certainly do that with some of our most advanced capabilities. But what we would really like to do, and it is spelled out in our defense strategy, is prevent that conflict from happening in the first place by convincing the enemy that they cannot win in a conflict, that the cost of entering into a conflict would be so high to them, they don't start it to begin with. That's the essence of deterrence. Deter, and if necessary, defeat. So the problem with only having ace in the hole capabilities is they do nothing for deterrence. I'm reminded of one of Senator Angus King's favorite quotes from the movie Dr. Strangelove, where Dr. Strangelove declares, the whole point of the doomsday machine is lost if you keep it a secret. <laughs> right. So we also have to decide what to reveal as what to conceal. Let's take the B-21 long-range strategic bomber, for example. The B-21 is an acknowledged special access, highly classified program. The Air Force acknowledged the existence of the program, and everyone knows what a long-range strategic bomber is for. That is, it's an offensive capability that holds global targets at risk but we keep its actual specifications and capabilities highly classified. The mere existence of the B-21 program acts as the deterrent. So what space capabilities do we reveal to bolster deterrence, and what space capabilities do we keep as our aces in the hole? Right. Well, sir, what's the way ahead on this then? And, you know, really, I guess we'd have to get down to who are the stakeholders who are involved, and then how do we drive solutions to the issue? Well, in my opinion, we need a very disciplined, thorough, and robust process to decide what to reveal and what to conceal, not only at the DOD level, but also at the National Security Council level, as, as this goes to the heart of our national security strategy and our very American approach, which is to deter conflict from happening in the first place. Then, once we're informed by this robust process, when new technologies lead to new capabilities and programs, we need the same discipline applied to the decision calculus on how that program should be classified. Who needs to know and when and at all levels of warfighting, from the strategic to the operational and to the pointy end of the stick at the tactical execution level. And finally, we'll have to ask ourselves, how will we then demonstrate and exercise those capabilities that we choose to reveal that would contribute to deterrence? Yeah, well, sir, uh, you make it sound... Uh uh, very concise and clear. And I really appreciate uh, you breaking this down for us. And thanks for being here today. Sure. Thanks. Lee. Now, as we explained at the beginning of this episode, challenges involving overclassifications aren't restricted to the top levels of command. Uh, folks at the operational level, and by that, I mean people actually directing mission activities on the front lines, they're facing a lot of challenges too. So next, we're going to turn the mic over to Chris Stone, who recently joined us as a senior fellow uh, for space studies at the Mitchell Institute's Space Power Advantage Research Center. And some quick background on Chris, he serves as a special assistant to the deputy assistant secretary of defense for space policy in the Pentagon. And he also served on space staffs for two secretaries of the Air Force. So Chris, thanks for coming out. Thanks very much. Appreciate being here. All right. Well, diving right in, Chris, uh, we just spoke to Mr. Donovan about his experiences at the senior executive level in the executive branch. What are ways you've seen in your policy experiences where security classification or over classification has been a challenge? Sure. So in my experience at the mid mid level policy arena, I've seen situations where organizations uh, over classify documents 
or even classify documents that are unclassified uh, for various reasons. So for example, sometimes an organization will classify something um, for more restricted document control. So to prevent leaks or things like that, or some organizations within the interagency that are more competitive for influence and dollars might retain information at a higher level of classification than needed because they don't want a, the other office to necessarily have that much information. It was kind of like what we heard from Mr. Donovan earlier about how you're in meetings, but you can't talk about the capabilities and things of that sort, whether it's a budget or whatever. And all that creates barriers to decision-making discussions and policy-making at the mid-level that has to produce a lot of these documents and, and, and recommendations for senior leaders. At the operational level, such as in air and space operations centers in the theaters, classification issues can abound between space and air operations. So, so for example, um, in my military side, I was a strategy guidance chief for a few times, and most of the people in AOCs have secret clearances. And space folks like me, strategists typically have SCI, and in some cases, even special access program read-ins. And so because of that, that division and classification, we could not give good rate reasons to some of the air planners and targeteers why we were waving them off of a kinetic hit or a non-kinetic hit. We had to put nebulous language in the air operations directives, air tasking orders, and other things to wink in a nod at the fact that we were doing something, but we couldn't specify what that was necessarily. Only a very few list of people like Mr. Donovan mentioned, the three star and the four star might be fully read into it with a handful of other folks. So this has created issues with us as U.S. people, but it also created some challenges with allies as well. Well, uh, can you talk to that? Can you give us an example of uh, like an allied relationship issue? Sure. Um, first, at the operational level, because space is a has nonstop global reach, we obviously have uh, various sites around the world that are necessary for command and control of our vital space systems and ground infrastructures. And so at those sites, in the foreign countries, we have allied mission directors running crews, um, not just US folks. So in many exercises that I've been a part of, we could not even speak to our exercise scenarios with these allied mission directors, even though in real life, they would have been part of the whole discussion from the very beginning. So we had to have two different mission directors. We had to have an exercise mission director that was US only, and we had to have an allied mission director that was working real world. It was very strange. And, yeah. at, the, and at the more strategic level, uh, we were dealing with like allied partnerships, um, building and things of that sort in the space arena. Sometimes allies will want you to provide unique space capabilities that maybe the United States is really good at, but due to their importance to national command and control, um, nuclear NC3 or whatever it is, uh, it's very difficult to decide what to share or how to share it. And in some cases it could take years, more than three years to get through negotiations with the interagency, much less the allies in providing something as simple as SATCOM. Right now, taking the devil's advocate perspective here, I'm sure that there are you know, important reasons for some of these concerns you know, uh, to have to balance out. So what do you say to that? And what do you offer as a solution? Oh, that's absolutely true. I mean, you definitely want to have some balance there um, because sometimes government leaders um, you share information with um, on the allied side uh, have friends with their countries that are less than friendly with us. So for example, we may have an allied country uh, that's friends and partners with another country that we consider to be an adversary. And so you got to be careful with what you share so that they don't necessarily share that to them. Um, Overclassification, though, while seeming to be the easy fix of this, is sometimes not as easy as it looks and not as helpful as it was perceived to be. So it's important to know that while it's fairly easy to classify things, it's a lot harder. It takes a ton of people in a lengthy, lengthy process to get it fixed. In fact, when I got to OSD in 2018, they were already looking at declassification of, of space items. Uh, but this is still obviously an issue and has yet to be resolved completely. So all the questions still abound. Do we share the data only? Do we share operational practices, orbital element sets? Do we give them access to all the data or just specific pieces? All these types of things can create barriers to partnerships. But as you say correctly, there must be the right balance. We just need to be sure that we review that frequently to know what that is. Yeah, I think like we said, you know, the, the devil will lie in the details and uh, making sure that there is a way uh, to share the information, especially during uh, operation times uh, or operational times uh, is, is where it's uh, going to be critical. So, Chris, I can't uh, say thanks enough for you being uh, here back on the Aerospace Advantage. No problem. Thanks very much. 
Now, this issue also extends past the walls of the Pentagon and can create issues for companies entering into the space field. So this is a really big deal for the Space Force, and they've repeatedly signaled that they want to broaden the pool of talent in the industrial base. And we can't do that if the classification process locks them out. So here to discuss his experiences with industry is retired Major General Larry Stetrim. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Slick. It's good to talk to you. I really love this podcast. Well, we love producing it and, and really enjoy talking to folks like you who've had a lot of experience uh, working with the aerospace industry over the years. So uh, what are some of the ways overclassification, especially in the space programs, has uh, impacted the key providers and the startups? Well, Matt Donovan uh, did a great job talking about you know sorting out what should be classified, especially highly classified and what shouldn't be. The, the problem is, or a challenge, is that the architecture of our security processes, uh, procedures, and especially the bureaucracy, and I'm talking about, in a good way, the good folks who live and work in that system, all that needs to be modernized for today's world, not the Cold War. And so defense industry uh, has conformed to this system as it exists, so it works for them. But it's not built to import uh, new entrants to a highly classified defense work. Yeah. And, and really breaking that down from what I'm hearing is classification, especially anything top secret or above is really creating a barrier. I mean, even secret does as well, but creating barriers uh, for the very type of uh, space talent that the space force leadership has said that they're trying to attract. Yeah, you got that right. It's a really perplexing topic. Uh, space force, as we all know, needs to import all the innovation ideas, expertise, intellectual property, all that it can to, to gain and, and maintain a huge winning advantage in space. Uh, in today's world, defense industry is only a fraction of the total ocean of technology innovators across the planet. It's a fraction. Uh, it's not like it was back in the 1960s. So it's imperative that the guardians import the best of the best from all that exists if they want to dominate. Um, but there are real barriers for anyone who wants to bring their technology and their talent to Space Force, for example, if they've never done business before at the top secret, you know, SCI level, uh, you know, whether it's a billion dollar company or small business, the barriers are the same. Um, so, let me give you an example. Say a defense company wanted to get into space defense business. Uh, well, the government puts out uh, uh, offers. Uh, the government wants to give somebody a contract, and they want as many people to compete to get the best company on that contract. So they send out a request for proposal. And in space work, many of these are themselves highly classified documents and they can be at a level that you know requires you know specially constructed and certified facilities uh, it requires highly secure communications uh, and then even the people have to have special uh, you know security qualifications certifications uh, to have access to the information and and at that high level those authorizations are tightly controlled. You, you can't just, you know, ask for them. They have to be part of a contract. So the challenge is a company can't have any of this, you know, these, these facilities, these communications, the people, the security billets uh, or positions. Uh, it can't have any of that unless it's already on a contract requiring highly classified work. And, you know, conversely, you can't get on contract if you don't, have all that stuff first. So the majority of that vast ocean of innovation is immediately cut out of the competition. And only the players that already play a small group, you know, compared to the global perspective, only that small group can play. Well, Stutz, that's a great point. Um, do you have any examples that you could share with us? Oh, I do. Uh, and it's a, 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 about a really good friend of mine. He runs a company doing amazing technology uh, to include laser communications, satellite designs of all kind, really new concepts. Uh, and he's doing really, his company, uh, leading edge capabilities. And his company is a large business. And, and he believed one day he had a lot to offer Space Force. Uh, he was completely unable 
to convince anyone in space acquisition to help him get into the game. You know, this whole notion that he couldn't download, secure, and read the proposals and create a, uh, uh, or the request for proposals and, and send back a proposal. Uh, so, but he was very determined to get into defense space. Well, he went out and he bought a small company that was already on a defense contract doing highly classified work. And they already had all those things, the uh, secured facility, the communications network, all the people, they were all, already have been uh, assigned those limited authorizations for the people. And so he, he basically bought himself into bringing his goodness to Space Force. And that's the alarming thing here. You know, what about all those highly aggressive and innovative businesses that can't afford to buy companies to get their talent into Space space Force? It's it's a tremendous story to kind of give perspective how hard it is. Well, sure. I mean, it's it's absolutely a chicken and egg scenario where uh, the service says it wants more competition, but you can't have competitors without the clearances and you can't get the clearances unless you are on a contract that has a program. So um, I think you've really summed up a, a lot of the problems that uh, the startups are facing. And, you know, this is where, you know, the case in point that this overclassification uh, is driving out innovation when the Space Force is actually uh, saying that that's what it needs is, is a new fresh idea. So if you were king for a day, what would you suggest as a way to fix the issue? Well, I have to say that um, I believe this is so shared among so many different government agencies. Uh, It has to start with the presidential directive to establish a task force that teams with industry. I mean, industry, small and big, has to be part of this. Uh, And not just defense industry, but well beyond. They have to examine the issue, and and there need to be new ways engineered. but in the meantime, uh, that, that's a big task. Uh, the Department of Defense, especially Space Force, uh, is in a position to innovate with this. And uh, they need to, as you said, the chicken and egg barrier, as you termed it, um, they, they need to have some workaround pathways. And, and one that I think is possible is to pre-process companies for clearances uh, and establish you know, actual government campuses where new entrants and small business can work if awarded a contract. Uh, and once they're established at some point in uh, defense work, uh, they need to support themselves, and they graduate from that program. Um, it's the only way you can maintain the importance of securing that information but getting all that goodness uh, from a larger pool of competitors out there. By the way, there are other barriers slick, uh, you know, like uh, in space industrial capacity, we got some challenges there. You know, exam- an example is the availability of clean rooms for a satellite uh, component and satellite manufacturing and so forth. There's just not enough in the country. And of course, they're expensive to build and certify. Uh, and there are other issues, manufacturability and then workforce, the, the talent pool is tremendously limited compared to what we need for the future. So bottom line, you know, if Space Force and the greater Defense Department does not access the vast world of talent and technology, we're setting ourselves up for becoming a second or a third rate military power. That's how it is. Well, well Stutz, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued and, and, uh, and I really love the idea of, you know, essentially a small business incubator uh, that the government could host so that you had the physical capability to uh, review a document. You know, of course, the individuals as part of a business would have to have the, uh, the, the clearances in order to go into that facility. But just to go there, review the contract, uh, the PWS and those types of things that you mentioned that uh, are going to be in the proposal and see if they can answer it. And then they would have a secure way to, exactly uh, right. to discuss it. And it uh, really sounds like a great idea. Yeah, there's some and there's some models uh, out there, you know, uh, uh, teaming between industry and uh, and government to facilitate those sorts of things, especially for small business. And uh, some of the leading edge technology ideas come out of small business. Absolutely. Well, again, Stutz, thanks again for being here on the Aerospace Advantage. You bet, Slick. I appreciate it. With that, we are at the end of our time. And you may have noticed that 
on this episode, we pulled from our own staff bench. And guess what? That's an indicator regarding how sensitive this topic is. We spoke to a lot of folks on it, but getting people to go on record was tough. And that's why we decided we needed to focus some attention on this topic. We totally agree with General Hyten and his call for reforms in this area. The only way it's going to happen is if more people understand the problem and call for smart action. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to you, our listeners, for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hammer down on that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment for us to let us know what you think about our show or areas you would like to hear more about. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Until next time, this is John Slickbaum. Stay safe and check six.